This is VD World. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali and you are watching Faultlands. In continuation of our conversation yesterday about the issue of Palestine, there were few issues that were left and we wanted to discuss in a separate program. So here we are with another program in which we are going to discuss the problems and atrocities happening with the people of Gaza. As we understand that the West Bank and Gaza are geographically slightly segmented, the state of Israel in the middle, and the problems of the people of Gaza are a bit different in nature than the problem of the people from the West Bank. Also, we are going to see if the Arabians or the Arab world is increasingly getting indifferent about the issue of Palestine. And we will also try to see if Palestinian issue is becoming diplomatically more abandoned in absence of interest from the neighboring states. Also, that United States is playing a, a bad role, uh, I would say, in stopping all the UN resolutions that have been passed in so many years. And if this remains to be the same attitude of the great superpower, then how the issue of Philistine is going to be sorted out. All of this in today's program, and I have again got a prestigious panel of guests to uh, decorate my program today. My first guest is Dr. Mohammed Abu Zada from Gaza, and he is going to tell us about the problems of the people in Gaza. I welcome you, Dr. Abu Zada, in my program. It's my pleasure uh, to be with you, sir. So we are discussing the problem of people of, of, of Gaza. And uh, the last time when we covered this topic was frankly during the 11 days of war uh, in which the entire world media was actually, uh, you know, uh, focused toward Gaza and seeing what was happening there. And then there was a media blackout from that point to this point. Uh, so, so tell us what has happened in the middle of these two points before we take the conversation forth. Okay, well, let me first of all say thank you for having me and inviting me to be part of this program. Uh, Gaza is a, a, a very small, tiny place on the Mediterranean Sea, which is about 365 square kilometers, with more than 2 million people live in the Gaza Strip. Uh, Gaza has been uh, under extreme Israeli siege and blockade for the past uh, 15 years since the summer of 2007 after Hamas took over uh, uh, the Gaza Strip and after the Palestinian uh, militant group Hamas uh, won the Palestinian uh, legislative elections, which were held in January 2006. And the, the results of uh, these elections were boycotted by Israel and the international. I can't hear you. We have lost uh, connection with uh, Dr. Abu Sada. Uh, what he has said so far is about uh, a brief introduction about the uh, place of Gaza, the strip of Gaza, which he said is 365 uh, kilometers of land stretched uh, uh, on the border of Egypt. And also the fact that there are 2 million people living here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Gaza is a, a place where uh, Palestinians uh, have been struggling uh, for, for their right, but uh, an organization uh, called Hamas is uh, the organization that decides the fate of the people. Not only it is the political front of uh, or the political face of the people of uh, Gaza, but also an organization that is doing a military struggle against uh, the illegal occupation of Israelis. And this is uh, an excuse that Israel always uses uh, against uh, against the you know to justify its uh, terrorism or its state-sponsored terrorism against the people of Palestine. We'll take a break and we'll join you back as our guest continues to talk in this program. Welcome back and Dr. Abu Zada, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science from Al Hazar University of Gaza will continue the conversation. Uh, Dr. Abu Zada, please continue where you left it from. 
Okay, uh, very sorry. The electricity got disconnected here in Gaza, which is very usual uh, in the Gaza Strip, and that's why we had a disconnection with the internet lines. Anyway, what I was saying to you is that uh, uh, the Israeli siege and blockade has turned Gaza into the largest open-air prison for more than two million people who live in the Gaza Strip, with uh, 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 poverty among the two million people in Gaza is about 80% uh, of the Palestinians here in Gaza live under poverty line, and unemployment uh, uh, is about 50%, uh, uh, and it even uh, goes higher among Palestinian youth and college graduates as a result of the Israeli siege and blockade, and also as a result of the Israeli closure of border crossing between Gaza and Israel. Which, as I mentioned, uh, just Israel has uh, uh, closed the only uh, uh, passage uh, between Gaza and Israel uh, 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 today as a result of rockets being launched from Gaza uh, against Israeli uh, towns and villages adjacent to the Gaza Strip. Dr. Abu Shada, Dr. thank you very much for bringing all of this up. Uh, tell us about uh, the, the political disintegration between various factions of Palestinians. So as we understand, uh, normally the p people of Gaza are represented by Hamas, that is a political as well as a military organization. And the people of West Bank have different political setup altogether. Does it continue to be the same arrangement today? That is a very good issue and a very good question. Uh, thank you for asking for that. Uh, let me say that uh, the split between the Palestinians in Gaza and West Bank took place as a result of the uh, 2006 uh, pr uh, parliamentary elections, which were held uh, in, in West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the result of, of that elections uh, that was held 16 years ago uh, gave Hamas, uh, 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 the military uh, movement, uh, 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 the majority of seats in the Palestinian parliament. And as a result of that, and according to the Palestinian basic law, Hamas was mandated to establish and form a Palestinian government uh, uh, after that. That government, led by Hamas, was boycotted by Israel uh, and, and the international community and other Palestinian factions, mainly Fatah, who is ruling the West Bank right now, uh, did not join Hamas government uh, in 2006. Uh, 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 um, as a result of that tension, internal tension between the two competing political factions, Hamas and Fatah, Hamas who is ruling Gaza and Fatah who is ruling in the West Bank, uh, uh, the tension uh, led to a very short-lived uh, civil war between the Palestinians' uh, 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 factions in Gaza that resulted in a political divide or a political split between the Palestinians where Hamas took over the Gaza Strip completely and uh, Fatah was driven uh, 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 to the West Bank, which uh, 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 which has been ruling uh, since. Uh, as a result of the Palestinian split, uh, 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 Israel, who doesn't recognize Hamas and doesn't deal with Hamas directly, uh, uh, classified Gaza uh, uh, right after the Palestinian internal split as a hostile entity. And as a result of that, uh, Gaza was uh, or has come under extreme Israeli measures and extreme Israeli uh, uh, siege and blockade. Now, going back to the Palestinian split over the past 15 years, uh, uh, a number of initiatives uh, which have been introduced by many Arab countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Egypt, and also uh, 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 mediation from the Palestinians themselves. Unfortunately, all of these uh, initiatives, all of these activities uh, uh, have failed so far to put an end to the Palestinian internal divide and restore Palestinian national unity. And as I'm talking to you right now, uh, Algeria has been engaged lately uh, to try to settle the Palestinian internal divide by inviting major Palestinian factions to Algeria to discuss how to put an end to the internal divide and restore Palestinian national unity. We are waiting uh, until after Ramadan to see how these efforts by Algeria, uh, whether it can succeed or not, to try to help the Palestinians and restore their national unity. Dr. Abu Sada, we were uh, in yesterday's program, we were also discussing the role of Egypt. And since Gaza is geographically quite close to 
and proximity of rather uh, Egypt. Tell us about the role of Egypt in specific. I have read in a few publications uh, that the people of uh, Gaza were having a lot of affiliation uh, with uh, President Mohammed Morsi. And ever since he has departed, the things have changed uh, drastically between Gaza and Egypt. So tell us if this is a fantasy or, or do you agree with the comment that I just made? Well, uh, it's true to some extent. Uh, uh, let me say that uh, uh, Gaza uh, uh, is on the uh, 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 has common borders with with Egypt. We have 14 kilometer of common borders uh, with Egypt, and the second uh, 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 and uh, uh, border crossing passage between Gaza and the outside world is with Egypt, where the Palestinians cross uh, 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 almost daily between Gaza and Egypt. Uh, for many years. And let me also remind you and remind your uh, uh, viewers that uh, Gaza was under Egyptian control or under Egyptian administration between 1948 and 1967, after the Palestinian Nakba in 1948, when Israel was established and took over uh, Palestine. Uh, uh, that little part of Palestine, which is Gaza, was uh, 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 taken by, by, by Egypt and was administered by Egypt until 1967 when uh, Israel launched an uh, uh, attack against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria and conquered all of Palestine, including West Bank and Gaza at that time. So uh, uh, during those 19 years of Egyptian rule or Egyptian administration of Gaza between 1948 and 1967, uh, Palestinians in Gaza were educated in Egypt, uh, uh, and there was a lot of uh, movement between Gaza and Egypt, which we say that we have a lot of historical, geographical, and cultural uh, relationships uh, with the Egyptians. Now, uh, 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 Hamas, who is ruling the Gaza Strip, is considered a part of the uh, International Muslim Brotherhood Organization, which uh, 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 the uh, ex-president of Egypt, Mohammed Morsi, uh, 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 was part of. So relations between Hamas and, and the, the Morsi presidency was very good. They both, Hamas and, the, uh, the, and Morsi, belong to the same political group, to the same political ideology, which is Sunni, of, uh, Sunni Islam. And uh, relations between the two entities uh, was growing uh, and fostering in a very good way. But things uh, uh, was uh, 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 ended with, with uh, a lot of complexities after Morsi was ousted and a new regime came to power in Egypt, which was antagonistic toward Hamas, because Hamas, uh, 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 who is ruling the Gaza Strip, was suspected of uh, 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 some of the uh, military activities. Uh, which took place in Sinai. Uh, there were uh, Egyptian accusations against Hamas or against Palestinian Salafis uh, who were uh, 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 part uh, or they were suspected to be part of the uh, internal uh, 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 military uh, uh, activities in Sinai uh, against the Egyptian regime. So, uh, 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 but now let's, let's uh, say that the relationship between Hamas and Egypt is a very good relationship. There is a working relationship between Hamas and the current uh, uh, government in Egypt, led by uh, uh, President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi. Egypt has mediated uh, 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 the latest ceasefire between uh, Hamas and, and Israel after the war that uh, was waged by Israel in May of last year, 2021. And Egypt has been engaged now also of uh, uh, rebuilding and reconstruction of Gaza after the deadly uh, Israeli aggressions against the Gaza Strip. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abu Sada, for being guest in my program. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Dr. Abu Sada for, uh, from the uh, Strip of Gaza. He's associate professor at the uh, Al-Azhar University of Gaza. And now I'm joined by Mr. Ahmed Zaki, who is a Middle Eastern expert and frequently appears on my show. Zaki, I welcome you to my program. Thank you so much for having me. And <coughs> tell us what has recently happened um, in, the, in Al-Quds, in, 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 the, uh, in the West Bank, 
and, and tell us what exactly has triggered this crisis at this very moment when Ramazan is in the last Ashura. Uh, as we know, uh, since the last 15 years, every Ramadan there was a clash between Israel and Palestine. The clash for the last year was extremely uh, inflated into almost 11 years full-fledged war between Hamas and Israel. And always it started from al Qasa Masjid. Uh, the problem that uh, arises over there is that the Palestinians are visiting the Masjid in Ramadan in extensively large in number where the young generations are already filled with hate and pressure of Israel, they start protesting after the Trawi prayer. And each protest is not going to be a peaceful protest. But currently what had happened was completely opposite. This year, the Jewish extremist was involved to go with the protest against the Palestinians who are visiting Al-Aqsa Al Masjid while Israeli, uh, Israeli police were protecting the Palestinians against the Jewish extremists to go inside the masjid. Unfortunately, Israelis, uh, Israeli armies didn't succeed to protect Palestinians, and Palestinians start responding aggressively from the masjid. And the crisis started slowly. But till now, the crisis are going on. What we are afraid is that, uh, in terms of Gaza, the Palestinian militant Hamas, their red line is Al-Aqsa Masjid. And they announced that 15 years before. They, they tell each, uh, each and every entity which are involved in the Palestinian, Palestinian-Israeli conflict that the red line is Al-Aqsa Masjid. So when you enter Al-Aqsa, we will respond from there, and when that, they respond that, from that, there, that will be Israel right. responds, and it's and a, a cyclical. The cycle of violence starts. Israel itself knows that. The, unfortunately, the new government of Israel, which is coalition, very weak coalition government, they were extreme, the leader of the, uh, of the new government is from the Zionist government, Zionist uh, uh, political party, which have extremist ideology of Jewishism. So by the Jewish believers, they, th they think that he compromised the, his promises before he came to the prime minister seat. Uh, keep in mind that in the Israeli administration, which are ruling right now the government of Israel, it's a coalition. Also, there is an Arab uh, coalition inside the government, which are Islamist also. So both are left and right wing side, and both of them are putting pressure on the Prime Minister of Israel. Here is the where conflict of the civilian is arising. There is a, 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 there, uh, there is a MB, member of National Assembly of, of, of Israel, he came to visit into Al-Aqsa Masjid, leading the protest of Jews to go inside the masjid. And this While is, uh, uh, and as you said earlier, this is now going to uh, bring, uh, you know, activate Hamas, and when Hamas gets activated, Israel is going Before to Before Hamas activated, the people who are already praying in the masjid, and Muslims, they are taking aggressive response from the Israeli invasion in the masjid, because this is considered as an invasion of the holy territory. All right. And when, when Israeli army tried to settle the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians because of it's under their uh, administration, that arise, th that creates a violence against the Palestinians because they are pushing a lot of pressure on Palestinians. Uh, but but Ahmed, isn't it a fact that during last several years, uh, particularly after Donald Trump uh, becoming the president of the United States and then leaving, I mean from that time onwards, the Arab enthusiasm about Al Quds has diluted to a great extent. Uh, Israel has started developing better uh, diplomatic relations with many powerful Arab states, yes. and uh, do you think that this also have an impact of now Israel becoming, you know, more uh, open uh, in its brutality? We should have to understand two things. There is very less Arab countries in the world who have a foreign policy independence. All of them are controlled by American and Western allies because of their wealth are distributed, are kept in the Western banks. 
So it's very, very, very rare that you will see an Arab state is going against the Israel. So, so, so does that bring us to the point? That, is, that shows that the Arab cannot take any union decision against Israel. But it was the Arabs that actually took the decision of going on an all-out uh, all war against uh, Israel twice in the past. That's when they were independent. That's when the foreign policy of Arab countries were independent. Mostly they were dictatorial regimes which was against the American influence or Western influence because they had their own power at home. Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. Uh, Jamal Abdul Nasser, Jamal Abdul Nasser. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, uh, Shah Faisal. All of them were powerful, but their wealth was not available at the Western banks. They were having their wealth at home. So whenever they sit into the table face to face with the Westerners, they were having an equal rights or equal power to negotiate. So you see economics at play. Economics had played a bigger role. Now you will see. The wealth of the Emirates available in UK, you cannot imagine how much the royal family of Emirates have in wealth. Let, in let's, UK. let's take it forward, uh, Zaki. Uh, so do you believe that geopolitically or strategically, uh, Israel does not face any challenge in the Middle East, but the only challenge that they have is today the state of Iran? Because it's Iran of which nuclear program Israel has always on record brought maximum fears on table and said, we are not fine with it. I, Iran is one factor which puts a lot of pressure on Israel. The existence of Iran in the region as an independent foreign policy, independent as an independent from the influence of the Western and state powerful ruling their affairs by themselves is extremely threat to Israel. If you find any other country around the area which have that much independency, it will be another threat to Israel. And that is why they are afraid also on Turkey. Turkeys have the similarities with that. Even though they are a member of NATO, and they are not going to go uh, against the Israel directly with military con conflict, conflict, but they can put a lot of pressure on Israel. Rather than that two countries, the rest of the Middle East is coming under the influence and the control of the Western allies. So everyone is afraid for their own wealth to be freeze by the Western countries. And Iran remains to be the only pressure point as you Pressure mentioned. point in the Middle East. So now tell me about this issue of settlements uh, in the West Bank because uh, settlements uh, are expanding and we have seen even White House uh, giving though hollow statements, but, mm -hmm. the, but certainly there are statements coming from the United States as well, mm -hmm. uh, declaring these settlements to be crimes and uh, you know, uh, saying that this should not have been done. Still the settlements are taking place and uh, taking more and more Palestinians out of their houses, out of their land. The settlement of Israel in Palestinian land was going on for the last 10 years, nearly 12 years it was going on. The policy which, which is behind this is driven by the American foreign policy. So no matter what political party comes, they might, they, might have, uh, they might have expression differences between uh, Republican or, or Democrats. The Republicans might express themselves as an, uh, as an openly, but Democrats are not openly expressing themselves. The reality behind this is that the companies which are building the, the land of Israel that the land of Palestine under the Israeli administration are mostly American companies. Why they don't want to phrase them, their accounts. This is the American construction companies who are building in the Palestinian land, occupied Palestinian territory. And the wealth comes from directly from Europe and West. And this is the Jews which are not at home. These are the Jews who are building the diaspora of Jews who are living in UK, US, they are and Europe. Ordering their homes to be. They are ordering there. from that countries, and the the, the accountants and the the currency, the, the the money which are coming from abroad directly goes through the uh, American banks and Western banks. So it is just only by the, by the saying that, uh, in saying good words, that we are against the illegal settlements. But the reality is that they are the one who is building 
the Palestinian uh, Ahmed Zaki, in Julia. a while, um, uh, a guest is going to join me on Skype. My producer is trying to connect to him. And he'd also shed some more light on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also seek your comments further once he gets into the picture. But tell me one more thing that is mm -hmm. very important, and that is the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor has had visited Ukraine within seven days of starting of Ukraine's war. Uh, ICC's uh, uh, chief prosecutor has not visited Palestine even once, despite the fact that the state of Palestine is in a state of war for, for decades now. Uh, so why these international organizations are uh, turning a blind eye toward the violation of human rights? Uh, these champion of human rights are turning a blind eye to the violation of human rights in the state of Palestine. Here is where it comes to uh, uh, there is a saying of the uh, former, <coughs> former General Secretary of uh, United Nations. He said, a diplomacy is good, but diplomacy back by power is an excellent. Uh, Kofi Annan. And when he is explaining this, he is explaining that the diplomacy is good to resolve the every conflict. But if the diplomacy have nothing power behind it, it have no value. And that is the truth. Palestinian claim have no any powerful country which is supporting their claim. Take for example, if the Palestinian case, if Palestinians not recognize it, any other Muslim country who is really honest on the Palestinian case can raise the case in the criminal court. They can take as an advocate for them, but none of the Muslim countries, 52 countries of Muslim countries, never raise the Palestinian case into the Zaki, I am very excited to let my uh, viewers know that I am now joined by Mark Mohanad Ayash. Uh, he is a professor of sociology at Mount Royal University, Canada. He is an extremely well-read and a frequently published author. He has published for Al Jazeera, The Buffalo, Middle East Eye, uh, the, the Breach and, and many other uh, international journals as well. Uh, I welcome you, uh, Mark Ayash, to my program. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And we are discussing the issue of uh, settlements, the Jewish settlements that are being made inside uh, the Palestinian la land. My guest in the studio, Ahmed Zaki, is of the view this is a major reason. This is the trigger point of the violence, particularly for the people in the West Bank. I need your quick comment on this, sir. Yes, absolutely it is. Um, the Israeli state uh, wants the entire uh, territory. They want the entire land from the river to the sea. Uh, we have to understand that Ever since 1967, Israel has had de facto sovereign control over the entire territory. They, they consider themselves the, the sovereign. Um, and they never really uh, uh, wanted or, or uh, accepted the idea of Palestinian sovereignty anywhere. Um, so th this whole idea of, of people saying that the, you know, the settlement gets in the way of the two-state solution and all of that, for Israel, it doesn't. Uh, because Israel's idea of the two-state solution is not the Palestinian or even the, the, you know, what most people around the world would recognize as a, as a just two-state solution, assuming that that would be just at all, by the way, we'll, 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 but we'll put a pin on that. Um, but the, the, the Israelis always thought of the two-state solution as the Palestinians would recognize that all of the <coughs> lands that were conquered uh, by the Israelis in 1948 are off limits for the Palestinians, there's no right of return. Uh, you know, all of that is, is just now Israel and, and Palestinians have to accept that. And, and then it, it, it viewed the, the territories that it would give the Palestinians some ability to do self-governance in, to be still under ultimately Israeli sovereign control, and that therefore Israel would have access to those lands. Um, and, and so settlement um, is at the core of, of the Israeli project. And, and the whole Israeli project is about um, uh, expanding settlements into all Palestinian territories until they create their goal of greater, quote unquote, greater Israel, where Israel would be um, the official sovereign over the majority of the land, if, that the, if not the entire land, the overwhelming majority of the land, if not the entire land. Um, and and that, that the, the territories and the lands that they would be sovereign over, officially sovereign over, would be populated by a majority Israeli Jewish population, which means the expulsion of Palestinians from their lands. Listen to the Israeli prime minister just a couple of days ago on CNN. He's still, you, you know, he's using words as Judea and Samaria. He doesn't even <laughs> use the words West Bank. 
Uh, he, he disputed the idea that these are occupied territories. He called them disputed territory. Uh, he, they want it all. Uh, that's very clear. And, and that's what Palestinians have been resisting against for almost a century. Um, that's where uh, uh, Israeli violence is directed towards, and that's what Palestinians are resisting. It's the expulsion of Palestinians from their land and the replacement by Israeli Jewish settlers. Uh, Mark, do you, do you agree with me on that, uh, if I say that the Western media has an important role to shape the perception of the people from around the world? And perhaps it is because of the biased reporting <clears throat> by major media outlets from, uh, outlets from the West, that people at large in the United States and Europe do not come out on the streets for protests for what is happening. They're, they're more concerned about issues happening elsewhere, like the issue of Ukraine, which certainly is a major humanitarian crisis, but they have lesser attention toward such crimes against humanity. Absolutely. And, and look, the, this whole project of settler colonialism started in Europe. It, it's, it's supported, it was supported by the, the British Empire in the initial parts of the 20th century and into the middle parts of the 20th century. And then it was supported by the Americans, the American imperial power um, that took over much of uh, the old British Empire. Not in the same way, of course, but um, their interests, uh, American interests in the region are, are very much imperial in their, in their foundation. Um, so it's not, it shouldn't surprise us that that media in in Europe and in, in in North America does not give much attention to the Palestinian struggle and when it does it's always done in a very careful way where it, it is um, you know Palestinian suffering for example is presented as um, you know somehow this uh, you know unfortunate thing that happened to these palestinians but it's really too complex to understand why it is that they're suffering and you know they, they go through these kind of uh, uh, rhetorical maneuvers to to kind of um depoliticize the palestinian struggle when when it is presented um but but it sh again it should not surprise us that we don't get a fair hearing in these spaces uh, because these are strong allies and supporters of the Israeli state. As Biden said in this speech uh, in either the late 80s or the early 90s, I can't recall when he was a congressperson, uh, and he said, you know, if Israel didn't exist, we would have to create it. Um, uh, meaning Israel is critical for American imperial interests in the region. He doesn't call it imperial interest, but that's what it is. Um, and, and so... You know, American media, especially Canadian media, uh, but but really anything across Europe as well. Uh, there, it's going to be very difficult for Palestinians to get uh, not just our individual stories, but our our our, our story as an anti-colonial struggle. Uh, that will not really. I'm not so sure that we can break through. Um, some of those ideological barriers and tell that story to the main public, but. If we can't do it through mainstream media, then then we have to go through other means. Uh, other means, and 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 many Palestinians have made uh, excellent use of social media to to um, to advance uh, their narrative and 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 um, and tell our story the way we want to tell it um, to the world. Um, uh, Mark, there is a video that I'm about to play now. This is uh, uh, in context of an interview that I did in the past with uh, Professor Abdul Hamid Sayam. Uh, he works for Al Arabiya and is covering uh, United Nation uh, for, for almost 20 years. He's a born Palestinian. And I asked him about the role of United Nation. I asked him because who better could understand? He's, he's witness of all these resolutions that have been historically presented over the last 20 years. I will play the video and then we'll seek your comments on what he said. If my team can just play the video of Professor Abdul Hamid Sayyam. The UN was unable to address the question of Palestine because the UN was not empowered by the permanent members of the Security Council to address the question of Palestine. It has passed many resolutions, in fact, and they, these resolutions could uh, address the question of Palestine, but it was prevented from implementation. I give you an example. 
The UN in 1947 passed the resolution 181, which divided Palestine into two states, one Jewish state and one Arab state. The Jewish state was established, but the Arab state had never been established because of the major powers who did not empower the UN to create that state. For example, the UN passed resolution 242 in 1967 following the war. It asked Israel to withdraw from the land it occupied after that war. However, Israel had never withdrew from that uh, land that it occupied in that war. That is the problem. So I don't say that the UN, uh, it was at fault as a UN, as a mechanism. The fault falls on the permanent member of the Security Council. Mark, your comments. He believes the United Nations role has been, uh, has been made ineffective by all these major powers that have a veto, a veto right there. Uh, he's absolutely right. It, 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 the, the sad reality is, um, is I think that ma many people who work at the UN, even diplomats that work in the United States, uh, in Canada, in the UK, they understand the situation. It's not that they don't know. The, the problem isn't knowledge here. They know what, that Israel wants the whole thing for itself. They know that Israel doesn't want really a two-state solution and have no interest in an independent, sovereign Palestinian state. That's understood. The, the, these people are not idiots, right? Like, they know, they know, they know what's happening. Um, and so I, there are many good people working within these institutions that are trying to advance uh, a, 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 a solution that would have a tangible um, uh, version of, of Palestinian freedom. At least they're not, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say they're trying to advance. They would want to see that. But, but, there, but the, the, the issue for me here is, is that w what are the results? There's no results. There, there, are no, the, the, there have never been a serious international effort to actually push for Palestinian freedom and sovereignty. I, I've not seen that. Um, we've seen some, you know, some countries that have said, okay, well, the two-state solution and let's push that. But again, those were very watered-down versions of the two-state solution that gave the Palestinians some semblance of full sovereignty, not even real full sovereignty, but a semblance of full sovereignty over just 18% of just the West Bank. That's it. That's, I mean, are we seriously considering that a serious push? It's not. And the major powers are the ones that don't want it. Um, because their interests are not in an independent, sovereign, free Palestine. Their interest is not in free freedom for Palestinians. Their interest is in uh, uh, the, the colonization of that land by an Israeli settler colonial project that is, it, it is aligned, that Israel is, would be and is aligned with American imperial interests and European imperial interests in the region. So, so that's that's what it always comes down to uh, uh, for me, and 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 I know that many people around the world, not just diplomats, but many people around the world, understand what is happening to Palestine, not just in Arab and Muslim countries, but across the African continent, in Latin America, in many places in in Europe, even like among the general population, people do understand that the Palestinians are being um, uh, violently attacked. Uh, uh, that the, that the what the Palestinians suffer is unjust and needs to be rectified. Um, Thank you very much, Mark Muhammad Ayash, for being guest <clears throat> in my program. Coming back to you, Zaki, uh, how far do you agree with what he just said, and how would you want to contribute to it further? As Professor Mark Muhammad said, he is absolutely right. There is no lack of knowledge <coughs> about the issue of Palestine across the world, regardless whether it is a a small country or a developed country, all the major powers and even the developing countries, every country, they know what's going on in Palestinian land. The question here is that the resistance from Palestinian side is extremely very weak against, the Pal against the Israel, number one. And number two is that the Palestinian, <coughs> Palestinian parties are divided into two, into two parts or might be three parts. They never come together to agree one, one we, term. We, 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 are, we are short of time, so I'm sorry we'll have to cut it here. But thank you very much, yeah, Ahmed Zaki. Welcome, welcome. Your point is taken. Ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Ahmed Zaki said in the last, the main problem is not only that the West is staying indifferent to the situation. The problem, the heart of the problem is that Palestinian resistance is weak in absence of a political cohesion.
We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz and Asr.